because there's been something else I've been fiddling around with for a couple of years, and that's uh, uh, Twitter, which I'm aware for many in the audience may seem even more ridiculous uh, than blogging. Uh, I actually think this is a hell of a lot more powerful and a hell of a lot more useful. Um, but I'm going to take you right from the beginning, which is this, the general uh, view of Twitter in the general population. Um, and I, I, I'm quite uh, familiar with uh, talking to people and saying I'm on Twitter and they say, oh God, is that just people telling you about what they've had for breakfast and Stephen Fry going on his own little... Or, or various celebrities going on their own little rants. Or During a certain time of year, there seems to be a proliferation of, of uh, one or two hashtags, which clearly I don't understand what it's uh, on about. But that's the general view of Twitter that I come across. Hopefully, today, you'll see something else. But I'll start from the beginning. What is Twitter? Formally, it's defined as a micro-blogging service and social networking site. So... What that means is that users such as myself broadcast very short messages of less than 140 characters, so that's shorter than an SMS message, in a kind of semi-public environment. Those messages are called tweets. Okay, those are then read by your followers, which is anyone who subscribes to your content. And they may then reply to you and kind of prompt some kind of interaction or further conversation, or they might actually forward your tweet onto their friends, that's called retweeting, who then may also reply and provoke kind of a wider conversation. And so the whole thing can start with just a single tweet that ends up kind of cascading through your followers and their followers and can actually have quite an impact quite quickly. So what does a tweet look like? Because some of you won't have seen well. This is a tweet, 140 characters. Um, it was a study published relatively recently, do SSRIs and pregnancy raise the risk of stillbirth and infant death? Not according to a study published in JAMA. I gave people the link. I assumed that some of my followers might be interested in that. Um, everyone has a, an account name that's unique to you. Um, in the lingo, that's a handle. Mine is at Peter underscore Tenant. Now that I realise that you're name has to be included in other people's tweets. I might have made that a bit shorter. Um, there's my hyperlink. Let's have another example. Um, this, uh, th this is perhaps less a useful piece of information and more uh, uh, me spreading what it's like living in research. Um, after I had some news uh, that a paper had been accepted in a journal I thought was quite decent, um, one of the senior authors responded in a nice email that said, uh, I'm surprised, but grateful. Um, and I thought, there might be one or two people out there um, who would be interested. So I, I, I tagged that. Don't worry too much about these. I'll explain them with a couple of index terms. And it did, you know, it got some responses by people. And the thing I wanted to point out here is when you do reply, the name of the person you're replying to, the handle starts to get included. So the more people you're replying to, the less space you have until you can only say, OK. <laughs> But yeah, you can't buy support like that, that's academia. <laughs> and then another example of what is quite common among those of us who are quite lazy tweeters is to pick up on someone else's comment and then shove a, an RT in front of it and say, I'm just retweeting that point. Maybe add a, a, an enlightened comment at the end, um, or not, as the case may be. But who reads them? I mean, I've just said that it's a semi-public kind of audience, and... and that's a, a point that's quite difficult to get across because a lot of people that don't use social media think, it's out there, it's on the web, everyone's going to be reading it. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't spend my time... <laughs> I don't spend my time just quickly scrolling through Twitter every day at all ra millions of random people going, what have they said that might be about me? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, really, it's mainly only, of course, read by your followers. Um, you know, they've subscribed to you, so they see it in their timeline, which you need to think about as a kind of news stream, news feed. This is something that you create. You subscribe to a bunch of people, and they provide this kind of stream of information that you can, can uh, tune into. Of course, you'll also get some information from people you don't subscribe to, but who your subscribers have thought... Oh, the, you know, your, your, your followers, the people you're following have thought, well, that's actually quite interesting. 
So I'm going to retweet that. So that's what Twitter generally looks like for the uninitiated. Um, the main thing is this thing on the right hand side, which is that news feed. Um, and depending on how often you refresh it and how many people you follow and so on, this basically will just keep updating with more and more information from people. The more you follow, the faster that moves and the scarier it becomes. Um, and then within that, obviously, you know, here's an example of a tweet um, from my brother, who I follow out of the goodness of my heart, although he's one of my few exceptions to my rule about um, uh, work uh, kind of focus. And as you can see, he's actually demonstrating a fantastic point about the general population's tweeting, because he's <laughs> interested in where he can get a cheap bacon sandwich and coffee uh, where he lives. At the bottom, there's another uh, tweet. This, this is not from someone I follow, though, so this is an example of a retweet. I follow Phil uh, Beatty, Batty, I, I don't know. Um, he's only the editor of the Times Higher Education. Um, and uh, he's retweeted this comment by someone who says they're about to give a session to academics on using social media. For, so for some reason, I was quite interested in what he had to say about that. But the third thing is you can actually find content by searching. Twitter has a search <laughs> box that you can type into and see if you can identify things. And therefore, kind of as a sensible, clever tweeter, you might be out there to try and make sure your tweet does get picked up by these non-followers. And to do that, you use keywords, which we call hashtags. It's one of those words that makes a lot of people cringe. It's only called a hashtag because one day, whoever it was in Twitter said, we need some kind of keyword system. Why don't we just start them all with a hash? And that was it. That was how hashtags were born. And now, the end of many tweets will have a little, a couple of kind of keywords with hashes on. And that's just so that you can say, okay, I'm interested in public health, so if I search for hash public health, then I'm going to get lots of kind of tweets relevant to public health, even though I don't necessarily follow um, many or any of these people. Some hashtags out there um, are kind of special hashtags as they act as permanent discussion forums. So the kind of examples I'm aware of and thinking of is things like PhD chat, PhD forum, ECR chat, uh, ACRI, which is kind of an academic writing <coughs> hash. And um, so here's an example. So I, you know, I was moaning about having been sent a, a paper um, to comment on, and I noticed straight away I've been demoted in the, the, the author order. You know. uh, so someone very usefully suggested I should respond by saying, this paper will be greatly improved by uh, restoring me to my rightful position in the authorship list. Some of them actually meet at specific times. There was one this morning at 10 o'clock, um, which I missed, but, um, and that was actually ECR chat, but um, they meet, and, and so the community of in this case, early career researchers who were um, you know, interested in, in whatever the topic was. When this one was done, I think it was right at the new year, you know, they were asking things like, well, what's your aims for the year? Um, and I had some fairly um, modest aims, uh, which strangely didn't include giving a, a, a Twitter presentation. But um, There is a lot of humour and a lot of comedy out there on Twitter, and that is why it is so popular in the general population. And if you follow, uh, if you want, and you can set up a, you know, a personal site and follow the, the, the right people or the wrong people, you'll get uh, a feed full of, of information about their favorite TV programs and, and their, their various um, feeding processes. But um, it is worth having a look. Some of these hashtags as examples of the kind of humour that is there. I mean, I'm not going to go into them in detail. Waitrose Reasons was a marketing campaign by Waitrose where they, they wanted to get people to, uh, to say why they shopped at Waitrose. <laughs> and uh, everyone thought, well, because it's really posh, so let's think, what can I put for Waitrose Reasons? Because it's the only place that sells the kind of hay that my pony eats, <laughs> you know. Um, anyone who knows Pippa Middleton's book on um, uh, tips of a, and advice, look for Pippa tips and you'll get some similarly um, amusing uh, comments. But um, I think that's for a personal account. Um, for me, I kind of think, right, 
If I follow people who tweet about my professional interests, my timeline, that newsfeed, is straight away, largely, full of comments that are relevant to my work interests. And so, without really having to do much, I suddenly have a distilled piece of kind of crowdsourced um, news feed about all kinds of things that might be interesting and relevant to me. That is very, very easy to do. That is something that you can join Twitter, follow a few people, and have set up within hours. So that's what I would call the most instant benefit. How, who to follow? Well, obviously, um, follow people you know are already on there to begin with, and then see the kind of people they follow. That might help. You could search for people with similar interests. I was told, for example, that I come across as a very woolly left-wing uh, tweeter, so I guess if I was looking for similar people, then that might be something I'm searched for. It's useful at this stage to point out you do have a kind of marketing bit in your Twitter uh, profile where you can say about yourself, so I said I'm a junior epidemiologist interested in public health stats and academic life. That's not for me. That's for everyone else who's looking and going, oh, okay, um, public health, maybe I'll follow him. Um, and obviously you can also, uh, Twitter also makes a number of sometimes useless suggestions about people that um, you might be interested in following based on who you're already following. But, although it's possible to kind of lurk there and use it as an information source, I think it is overwhelmingly most powerful when you use it actively. So what do I mean by using it actively? Well, you know, one of the things that would be really nice to be able to do is have a paper published and then actually kind of use Twitter to get it out there and, and increase its profile. So here's me putting out four tweets desperately trying to promote a pa that um, surprising paper that I had published a couple of weeks ago um, with very small degree of success. But there is a kind of more recent example uh, from some of my colleagues here of a, a, a paper that you can see Martin um, wrote about and immediately got 11 retweets, which if you think how that cascades, could be seen by thousands of people. So what? Well, there was an interesting piece of research last year that said, unsurprisingly perhaps, that the number of tweets um, about a paper correlates very strongly with the eventual number of citations. Now, this could uh, and probably is largely explained by correlation. You have a very, very interesting paper, people are interested in it, it generates this buzz, it gets lots of tweets, it then goes on and gets cited, but who knows how much kind of flow there is between over here, the social media buzz, and over there, the number of citations. It's perhaps at least worth, you know, keeping your mind open to the possibility. Is anyone actually counting this? Yes, they are. There's an organization called Altmetrics. Every paper out there has an Altmetric score. This is that one from um, Lynn et Forrest et al., um, which has a very, actually a very, this is a very large score of 73 because it had been tweeted 95 times. So that paper had really got quite a social media footprint. And at the moment, this is all probably just interesting. But there is a debate about what this will mean in the future. Will um, these kind of measures um, come into uh, the way that we're measuring kind of research output in the future? I don't know, but again, it's worth keeping an open mind. You can try and use this, uh, Twitter to recruit. Um, uh, I don't know if you know about this. Uh, uh, if you're going anywhere sunny, uh, <laughs> There's a, there's, a, there's a study going on, yeah, and, and I, I, Angela tweeted about that, and, and I retweeted that. Um, I'm not sure how successful that was, there's a, that particular tweet. There's an, perhaps a better example on the right here um, by another one of our colleagues who, who was just doing a simple survey, and they sent it out on Twitter, and they got kind of 50-odd uh, responses within the first 12 hours. And what I would say from that is that it's not a panacea at all. Right? There the are really important rules to bear in mind with this. Hard-to-reach hard communities will still be hard to reach. They're not going to be hanging around on Twitter following you. you know. So it, it is difficult. You're going to need a lot of followers to be effective. And, and the kind of sample you get will be a convenient sample. 
So that's great if you're doing a little MSC survey. Is it so useful in, in other respects? But what I say is probably the most powerful feature of Twitter is as a networking tool. This is also the one that is hardest to master and takes most time. So, you know, it offers this fantastic opportunity to meet and interact with other researchers beyond your normal network. And, and you know, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me how uh, the, the level of this reach. Um, a couple of months ago, I started being followed by Richard Horton, who was editor in chief of The Lancer. Oh, why on earth is he following me? I don't know, but nevertheless, it occurred to me. Okay, right, there was a, that's a big figure. He's following me. I had my first interaction with Ben Goldacre. I shouldn't be too excited about that, but nevertheless, he's somebody that a lot of people know. Certainly on Twitter, there is less of a sense of hierarchy. The debate on the um, ECR chat today was about managing the academic hierarchy. Um, one way I'd say to actually start to break through that, join Twitter. It is a lot easier to start talking with people who are very high and mighty on there than it is to walk up to them at a conference and say, hello, I've read your work. Oh, okay, you want a coffee? Mm -hmm. Now, bye then. <laughs> um, um, and theoretically, you can make connections outside the Ivory Tower. I think Dot's a lot better at this than I am. I wrote this and then went for a big search through my follower list to see if I could find anyone outside the Ivory Tower. And I found someone. Um, but... Um, you know, it remains to be seen how easy that is, certainly. When you go to a conference, you then really realise, suddenly, how, what a difference Twitter has made. Um, I have met a number of people uh, at conferences who I would have never have gone up and spoken to, simply because we knew each other on Twitter. You know, I, I've had two or three say, you're Peter, aren't you? <laughs> who are you? Um, no. Um, and... Really, it's got to the point where some people are even asking nowadays, and maybe not so much in the field of public health epidemiology, we're quite archaic, but certainly in some areas, if you're not on Twitter, if you don't have social media, your impact now is really starting to look quite sort of quite poor. So that's something to bear in mind, and it's certainly when I went to my first conference as a Twitter active user that I realised that. But I can't leave without talking about some challenges. Um, the obvious thing, the thing that people talk about with blogging, it does require a time investment to get the most from it. When I say the most, I mean that kind of active, interactive networking. And it can be frustrating. I mean, certainly when I joined, for the first maybe six months, I just thought, I, I'm sorry, I don't see the point. I'm on here, nobody's following me. I'm these, making all these brilliant comments and nobody's even interested. Um, you know, so that was pretty frustrating. And, and, and another thing that I find difficult is that the content is so transient. I mean, because it's that constant stream of information, it can just disappear before you've even seen it, especially if you follow too many people. So you can favourite things, which is a kind of way of semi-archiving them, and you can come back to them later. So I often favourite something. I don't know why I would have favourite this one, should you quit your PhD, um, that I might think I'll come back and read this later. Um, I've discovered recently that actually these aren't permanent. As I went down to identify so, some favourites that I knew would be relevant to this talk today, they're gone. So I don't know how long they last for. I don't know whether it's a limit on the number of favourites or the time, but um, even that's not permanent. So, And then there's spam, like any media form. Um, the most uh, threatening, I suppose, are the phishing messages that people get. So... Um, <laughs> Dot's laughing, I can't imagine why. Um, uh, so you might get a message that looks something like this. Uh, you, you know, I've seen you doing something silly on Facebook, click here, and then it will hijack your account. Only so they send out more messages that look like this at the moment, but it's annoying. Don't click on anything that looks like that. You also get these kind of electronic bot followers sometimes, as Dot calls them, the porn brigade. Um, because sometimes it's quite obvious, as soon as they... <laughs> I don't know whether I was flattered at first, but um, uh, it's very easy to report them and get rid of them. And they'll, but it's just another thing that kind of ruins the professional image somewhat. And then finally, for me personally, I would say it's not always easy to get the right balance of personality. You have to have a personality if people are going to be interested in you. 
and professionalism. So I have this rule, because there is, and I have, caused offence. Never say anything on Twitter uh, that you wouldn't be willing to say in person out loud to a room of your colleagues. Um, I have discovered that, although I would be willing to say it in person out loud to a room of my colleagues, some people still get very offended. Um, so you can consider adding a disclaimer. I say, tweeting in a personal capacity, views may not reflect those of Newcastle University. Does it make any difference? I discovered a couple of weeks ago, certainly not. Um, I was involved in a little thing where you were supposed to be talking to yourself ten years ago at the beginning of your academic career. Dear me! So I was imagining that I had come up, what would I say to me? Go away, you nauseating post-pubescent man-child. Can't you see I'm busy? Well, it got quoted in the Times Higher Education, which is fine, I don't mind that. It got quoted like this, Peter Tennant, Research Associate at the Institute of Health and Society at Newcastle University. I never mentioned I was that anywhere, but there we are. Never mind, still remember, it is a social network. And my kind of favourite example of this is this hashtag that was going around about a month ago called Overly Honest Methods, which actually ties into that whole Fuse blog thing about demystifying science, because this was when scientists en masse suddenly started being honest about maybe some of the areas we make shortcuts here and there, or some of the decisions we make. So I said, well, there might be a few more relevant studies out there, but my library doesn't have access, so I'm pretending they don't exist. And that had more retweets than I'd ever had for anything else before. So that reminded me, in the starkest terms, once again, it is a social network. <laughs> If you want to join Twitter, here are the people you should all start following immediately. These, I apologise to anyone in IHS who's, who does have more than 100 followers, who have not put on a hair. There's quite a few of us already. I found it really hard just to try and track down these people, but definitely start with them. Great content. And you can start reading as well. There's some, uh, there are some useful guides out there, including my uh, blog on a rubber chicken. Right. Okay, I'm aware that even though I told Peter... 10 to 15 minutes, he's gone over. Um, anybody got any burning questions?